So, you know, today is a very special day because three years ago, a lot of things happened here. We were all very uncertain, okay? We didn't really know what was going to happen, how the Lord was going to move, right? So, three years ago, uh, on October 9, 2011, there was about 300 of us that came together here by the grace of God and began to worship Him. Now, if you will see, the, this is the title of the very first message we had here. It was called Claimed. Why Claimed? Well, think about this. You know, in the airport, diba, when you leave the plane and you're about to go home, what do you do? You go to the baggage claim, to claim your maleta. Diba? Okay, just like here, you know, CCF was in Makati for many, many years. In, from the mid-80s, do you remember the history of CCF? We started out in AIM, we went to Greenbelt, and then our office was here in Reposo. Do you remember that? Well, what happened? For many years, CCF left Makati for I think it was a whole decade or so, or even more. But finally, three years ago, CCF came back. So we claimed, in other words, the city for the glory of of God. So let's give him a clap offering again. So let me ask you a question. The, who among you were here already in the early days when we first started three years ago? Raise your hand. Okay, I can see. Yes, yes, yes. Praise God. Praise God. So most of you, most of you joined later on. That's okay. That's great. You know, when we started, we were only 300. After three years, by the grace of God, if you include our satellites, we just had our inaugural worship service in La Paz last week. Do you remember that? We are now, by the grace of God, 1,200. Give all the glory to God. All the glory to God. It's been Him working throughout. And we have been just so awed and excited at how God has moved so mightily. All right? So, do you remember three years ago, this was flashed on the screen three years ago. These were our targets. These were our goals. Even then, we had a vision for CCF Makati. You know, it was actually Pastor Jess Lantin, believe it or not. Oh, I don't mean anything by that, okay? But pa Pastor Jess Lantin was the one who challenged us to put up CCF Makati. Of course, it was the hand of the Lord. But God used him as an instrument. All right? So, these were some of the goals that we had, the targets. The first one was this. Can you read this? To establish a CCF church like Alabang and Eastwood, initially comprised of 300 believers. Did that happen? Yes. What about this? To hold weekly Sunday worship services at the location with the Sunday school and key ministries. Did that happen? Did the Lord move? Amen. What about this? Hold weekly MBS. That's Monday Bible study, midweek worship services, evangelistic outreaches, and other similar events. Did this happen? Yes. What about hold weekly GLC courses? Did this happen? Why is the yes getting weaker and weaker? Are you falling asleep again? Did it happen? Yes, amen. And then, what about this? Establish a committed team of workers for various ministries to cater to the spiritual and other needs of families and individuals within the city. Did this happen, my dear friends? Yes, it happened. Okay? So God has been blessing us as a church. God has been moving mightily. Okay? He has given us an area. Initially, he gave us Makati. But two years ago, we had a meeting with the, higher, with the leadership of the National Church Planting of CCF in Clark. Okay? And the result of that meeting, one of the results rather, was that they assigned an area to us. And this area was called Metro Southwest. This is our mission field my dear friends, okay? So we started with Makati, and then 
a few months ago, we started worship service every Sunday at, on Show Boulevard, Liberty Center. And then, last week, we started, where did we start? Do you remember? La Paz, Sincamas, Zapatillas at Mani. No, no, joke na yun. Sincamas. And then, Pasay. Okay, we now have a community church in Pasay. Are they here, by the way? Carlo, Butch, are you guys here? Huh? Twelve. Thank you, Marco. You seem to know all the answers, my friend. God bless you. And then, we also have something going on in Taguig. All right? And finally, next week, by the grace of God, we will start our first worship service in Manila. Is God good? Let's give him another clap offering. So, my dear friends, this is the mission field that God has assigned not only to your pastor, not only to your COS and your church workers, but to whom? To each, listen to me, each and every one of you. You are part of building God's kingdom. You are all workers. Is that right? Do you agree with that? Oh, where is your high, loud, resounding yes? Yes, of course you're part of that. This is not only for us. This is for all of you, too. We're all together in this. We are all part of what? Kingdom building, expanding the kingdom of God. So let me ask you a question. How does this all start? Where did this all start? Where did CCF start 30 plus years ago? How did it start? It started with what? started with a vision. It started with a vision. What does vision mean? Vision means what we desire for the future. It's our goal. It's our objective. And for CCF in general, what is the vision of CCF? Can we all read it together? To see a movement of, oops, millions of Christ-committed followers meeting in Small group, transforming lives, transforming families, transforming communities, transforming nations. For what purpose? For the glory of God. For the glory. This, my dear friends, is the vision that we have in the movement. CCF is not a religion. It is a movement. It is a movement directly linked to the movement that Jesus Christ himself created when he left his, his disciples and he gave them the mandate and he gave them the vision. My dear friends, we are continuing on with that vision. Why is that? Because there is work to do. Do you agree that the world needs the Lord? Of course the world needs the Lord. What has been happening a lot of things, a lot of not good things have been happening over the years. Society has been declining. Sin has been prevailing. Am I right? So we, God's people, have a special assignment. God has given us all, each and every one of us, no exemptions, my friends, no exemptions, a special vision, a vision of service, a vision of change. A vision of transformation of lives, of communities, all these things. We are all part of this. So why is this vision so important? Because Jesus himself in Matthew 5.16, what did he say? What did he tell all his followers? Let's read this together. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, if you notice that Jesus wants us all to show we are the light. Okay? We are the light. Why is there darkness? We, if we are the light, then what is the darkness? The darkness, my dear friends, is the domain of darkness, of Satan. The darkness because of sin. Is there a lot of sin all over the place? Yes or no? 
So our mandate from the Lord, my friends, is to overcome sin, to be used by God as His people to light up the darkness. Nobody likes darkness, right? Whenever there's a typhoon, it's rainy season now. What happens sometimes? The transformers get hit. There's flood. What happens? Brown out, right? We don't like it, right? But the real darkness, my dear friends, is iniquity. It's the sin of mankind that has exponentially been increasing. Am I right? Has sin been increasing all around you? Well, my dear friends, the vision of the Lord for us is to be the light, to overcome the darkness. We are all expected. God wants each and every one of us to be part of this. In fact, He said, do not hide the light under a bushel. Remember that in Matthew chapter 5? He says, expose it. Let the light come out so that the darkness is overcome. Expose it. So how do we bring glory to God if we do not have vision? In Proverbs 29, 18, the Word of God tells us that where there is no vision, what happens? The people perish. Are we going to allow this to happen? Are we going to allow everybody to perish? The souls that are supposed to be Saved. If they are not saved, what will happen to them? Are we all together in this? Are we going to allow this to happen? No vision. If we have no vision, my friends, if we do not share this vision that Jesus Christ gave us, then what is life all about? You can become rich. You can become famous. You can become successful in everything you do. But at the end, when you are on your deathbed, Tell me, will it matter? Will it matter? Will it matter? Think about that. So what are our priorities? Where do we see ourselves? What do we see ourselves doing? If we do not have vision, my dear friends, then very sadly, we are what? We are blind. You know that many, many Christian churches in the world today, unfortunately, do not have vision. Many, many of them are shrinking and getting smaller and smaller. If you go to Europe where Christianity started, all those huge cathedrals, they're just museums now. There are no more followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, they have lost the vision. They are now blind. This lady, Helen Keller, is very well known. Even in spite of her being blind and deaf, she was a very successful author. She wrote 13 books. She said this, the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but no vision. But no vision. So today, we will talk about vision. Vision, the dream that God puts in each and every one of our hearts. A few weeks ago, we talked about this guy. Do you remember him? This guy started out as a slave, he, but he later on became a prime minister. When he was young, God placed a vision. He was a visionary. God placed a dream inside his head. And this dream involved leadership and service. But it did not happen right away. He had to go through a lot of what? Do you remember the story? Of pain, of trials. He was sold. Imagine his brothers wanted to kill him. And instead, they sold him to slave traders, and eventually he got to be a slave of the Pharaoh's bodyguard named Potiphar. So in spite of all the difficulties that Joseph, Joseph is our fourth patriarch 
And you all know we've been studying the book of Genesis. We're about to be done already. It's almost the end of the year. Okay? But Joseph was special. And he had a special vision and a special dream. And although he went to go through much trial and pain, it did him good. You see that? Remember earlier we talked about transforming lives? You know, God is really after each and every one of our transformation. And Joseph transformed, and in spite of all the pain he went through, God never abandoned him. God was always with him. So it was a great story that started with a vision. So if you think about it, what do I, what do you, what do we have to do with the story of Joseph? My dear friends, as we now are at the threshold of another year here at CCF Makati Metro Southwest, I'd like all of us to get involved in this vision that Jesus Christ left for each of His followers. And let us expand it together. Let us work on it. Let us make it happen. Can we do that? Amen. Jesus had a very special vision. If you notice, Matthew 6.10, can you read this? We all know these words. They're all very familiar to us. What does it say? Let's read it together. It says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That was Jesus' prayer to His Father. That is what Jesus has taught each and every one of His followers to pray. Do you remember that? Matthew 6. Now, if you think about it, what is the difference between heaven and earth? Why did Jesus pray that? Sin? Could it be sin? Because there is no sin in heaven. So what is Jesus' desire? Jesus' desire, His vision for each and every one of us is to work together by the power of the Holy Spirit to eradicate sin on earth. Do you agree with that? That is our primary mission. That is God's vision, my dear friends, of a changing world to eradicate sin. And God desires that each and every one of us to come to a saving knowledge. You know that God is a good God. He is a God of love. He does not want any single soul to go to hell, to perish. All right? So our part is to serve Him by building His kingdom through the salvation of souls. I don't think it can get any clearer than that. And you may think, I am a doctor. I want to get a diploma. I am a businessman. I want to build my, my conglomerate. Whatever your goals may be, there, is, there are nothing compared to the one overriding purpose why we are here on this earth, my dear friends. That is to serve God and to build His kingdom. Amen? Amen. So let us think about that. We must now align ourselves to the vision of God. Okay? How do we do this? May I submit to you. We cannot export what we do not have in us. So before we even serve God, we must make sure, my dear friends, that we are transforming, we are growing, we have a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord God. Amen? Before we can do anything, we have to make sure. This is first base. Are there changes in our lives? Are we still committing the same sins over and over and over again? We can tell the whole world, hey, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I, I, I go to CCF, you know. But they will see the change in our lives. And my dear friends, if there is no change, then what are we doing? We're just hypocrites. So how do we change? We have to get intimate with the Lord. You know, in Matthew 4, 4, it says, Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need to get deep into the Word of God. We need to get on our knees 
and pray every day. There is no substitute to a close and personal relationship with our Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. This is our number one objective. So, if we are not doing this, if we are not doing this, my friends, if we just somehow just, oh, I like the singing in CCF. Yeah, I like to dance. and You know, I like, I, I like the, the Spanish bread and tamis. And sarap. Diba? Then perhaps there is a disconnect. Perhaps hindi tayo masyado nagkakaintindihan. Because it says very clearly, can you read this with me? How are we saved? How are our souls going to heaven? Okay, let's read it. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. So how are we saved? We are saved because of one thing. That is God's grace. God's grace. In Tagalog, ang biyaya ng Panginoon Diyos. It is something that we cannot earn. It is something that we cannot pay for. It's a gift. Salvation is a gift. Alright? What is our part? God's part is grace. Our part is faith. Faith. You know, we can believe it up here in our minds. Yeah, I know Jesus Christ is God. Yeah, I know Jesus Christ died on the cross. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know He's called Redeemer. Yeah, Savior. Yeah. But I know it up here. Is it in here? Because if it is in here, then there will, whether you like it or not, be change. That the change, the transformation, is the evidence, my dear friends, that we are saved because of our faith. Faith, according to the book of James, if it is not accompanied by works, by good works, is dead. It's dead, being by itself. You can claim to have faith, but if there is no change in your life, then sorry to say, my dear friends, there's something wrong. In verse 10, it says, for we are His workmanship. What does that mean? Each and every one of us, we are God's projects. You see, God is very, very specific about each and every one of you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He wants something from you. He wants to produce something in your life. And we may just want to breeze along and, ah, total, babunta na akong langit, okay na ako. No, it cannot be. You were designed and God created you for good, what? Works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see what I'm saying? God is so particular about this. Each and every one of us is God's specific project. Have you had a project, ladies? Do you do some knitting? Okay, or men, you know, your, your project is to improve your swing in golf, perhaps. Well, we are God's projects. God is delighted, interested, focused on each and every one of us. And you know what? The good works, where are the good works? They are a byproduct of a changing heart. You understand what I'm saying? The good works is not what will take us to heaven. The good works is the evidence that we are headed for heaven because of our faith. Does that make any sense to you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes? Or no? I'll repeat. This is so important, my dear friends. Each and every one of us, we can come here for the next 20 years, but if we don't understand this, are we in trouble? And it is my job to keep on explaining this so that all of us, you know my desire, my dear friends, is that each and every one of us here in this room today will have a place in heaven. Is that a good dream? Is that a good vision? So God is more concerned with what's happening in us than what we do for Him. If there is no change, if there is no transformation inside of us, my dear friends, we can serve God from 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. But you know what God says about that? Without a changed heart, all those things that we do to Him in the Bible, it says they are like dirty linen, like rags. God doesn't appreciate it. Every single one of us in Christ needs to change. It's expected by the Lord to change. In, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it tells us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creature. What does that mean? The old things pass away and the new things come. There is a process. As you get closer and closer to the Lord, may pagbabago ang ating mga buhay. Nagbabago ang ating mga puso, mga kapatid. Does that make sense to you? Of course, when we just get to know the Lord, okay, what are we? Just like this. We're just like a baby. Okay? What does a baby do? He cries. He wets his diaper, right? So, in the beginning, we are all like babies. So, what do, what do babies need? They need nourishment. Okay, so if you have a baby Christian, later on we'll talk about that, somebody should be taking care of you, leading you, teaching you how to read the Bible, how to go to worship service, how to join a small group. Does that make sense? As a baby. Now, if for example, ilang taon na ang lumipas, and you are still a wah, 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 then you become like this guy. Okay, hindi na baby, ano na, bonjing. So, do we want to be a bonjing Christian? Tell me. Do we want to be a bonjing Christian or do we want to be a victorious Christian? Walking in victory with the Lord. Which one? Amen. Okay, so how do we do this? How can we substantiate changes? We, every week you hear testimonies of people changes. I, I'm sure you have heard mine. I've said it like 15 million times already. That I used to be an alcoholic, I used to be a womanizer, I used to be a drug addict, I used to be a violent person. But by God's grace, He gave me a second chance. God is a God of second chances, my friends. He gave me a second chance. And by the grace of God, I'm celebrating my 20th year of sobriety. Praise God. Now, please don't get me wrong. I do not want the credit. I am only saying this because I want to glorify who? God. Because He alone deserves all the glory. So how can we live this kind of life? How do we actually do it? By thinking perhaps we can think that Jesus died for me. So what will I do now? I will live for Him. Does that make any sense to you? Jesus died for me, so I will now what? Live for Him. We must show gratitude. Jesus paid a heavy price for us, for each and every one of us. He shed His precious blood. He suffered so much so that we could be with Him. So how do we show our appreciation, my dear friends? We must what? We must live for Him. Come on, let's get into it. It's our anniversary. I won't give you bread if you don't talk. Okay? So Galatians 2.10, let's read it together. I have been what? crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. See, what does this mean? I no longer live. It is no longer my life that is important. If my aspirations in the past were to become rich and famous, hindi na yon. mag na. I now live for whom? For Christ. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. So, my dear friends, no longer I, but Christ. That is the mindset that we need to take on. The second way we can expand the vision of God. If we say we love God, then God says, prove it. I love you, Lord. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Prove it. How do we prove it, my friends? By our obedience. God is very specific when He said, my vision for you, my followers, is be the light of the world. Go out there and fight the darkness. 
So in Matthew 28, you've heard this many, many times again, over and over. 28, 19, 20, basahin po natin, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Continue. Baptizing them in the So what is God's vision for us? How do we expand this vision? It's all about winning souls for the kingdom. All right? Winning souls for the kingdom. What is the greatest need of any individual? Think about that. Is it a need even to eat? Is it a need to breathe? What is the greatest need? The greatest need, can I submit to you, my dear friends, for any single person here on earth, is the need for a Savior is the need to be able to spend eternity away from that horrible place that we all know exists, but often don't think about it because it's not pleasant. It's hard. Am I right? But that's the reality of the situation. We each have a mandate. You know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus invited His disciples. He said to them, Come. Follow me. And these guys, you know, they were fishermen, they were carpenters, they were welders, they were computer programmers. No, no, joke long. And they dropped everything. They dropped everything to follow Jesus. They never knew what they were getting into. It was a total change from what they were used to. You know, even just teachings of Jesus about love, about compassion, about patience, about kindness, all these things. They were all new to them. But they did one thing. They said, yes, Lord, I will do it. I will follow you. I will follow you. And they were able to do great, great things through the Holy Spirit. They were used mightily by God. You know, this command, we often take it for granted. I remember about three weeks ago, we were having D12, and one of my D12 member said, you mean to say if we do not follow that, it is a sin? It is a sin if we don't share the gospel? If we just sit back and just let the pastors, let the missionary, yeah, yeah, sila nang bahala dyan. Is it a sin? What do you think? Yes. If you know what the right thing to do is and you don't do it, my dear friends, the Bible, it's not me saying it. That's called sin. So we must all focus on building the kingdom of God. According to Joel Rosenberg and Koshi said, every follower of Jesus Christ should be able to answer two simple questions. First, who is investing in me? And second, who am I investing in? My dear friends, This is the strategy of our Lord Jesus Christ. He dealt, if you will look at the Bible clearly, with one person at a time. He invested his time, treasure, talent, just as he expects each and every one of us to do the same thing. You know what? In my situation, I've shared this with you in the past. I am a lay pastor. I do not get paid. I still have to work for a living. A lot of times, to be honest with you, I get super exhausted. Okay? But what keeps me going is I'm doing it because I love the Lord. That's the honest truth. If I didn't do it for the Lord to serve Him, I don't think I could do it. But you know what? When we put ourselves at the Lord's disposal, I can guarantee you You will do things you never thought you could do. I used to be afraid to be on stage. But God changes us. He transforms us. He wants to use each and every one of you. You may not be here, but you have a part in God's kingdom. Every Wednesday, we have an event We would like to make sure that each and every one of you is following this. Somebody is investing in you as you later on will invest in someone else. 
You remember the mission of CCF? Make Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers. You are one of them. You are, that's for you. That's for each and every one of us. No exemptions. We all must serve in the army, in the kingdom. And you know the great thing is CCF anticipates, takes care of all of that. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let me just show you about GLC. This is a very nice video. Take care of our needs. To be able to serve well. I think there's a problem with the... As CCF continues to experience growth, the challenge before us is to prepare leaders, Bible teachers, disciplers, ministry leaders, church administrators, missionaries, and future pastors to lead more discipleship groups and future churches of CCF throughout the Philippines. As we embark to reach out to our families, communities, businesses for Christ with the gospel, we likewise need to develop, train, and equip potential leaders to carry on the CCF mission to make committed followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this regard, CCF has come up with its own leadership training school called the Global Leadership Center, GLC. This formal school will have several levels of leadership training designed to educate, equip, and empower you, our leaders for tomorrow. World-class leaders for a worldwide harvest. Every um, week, we have a GLC on Wednesday. So who among you has not yet taken GLC? It's okay, nothing to be ashamed of. Raise your hand. Not yet. Okay, we welcome you. We invite you to come. We are starting again GLC 1 soon. We are also starting level 2 and level 3 in the very near future. All right? So we would like to equip each and every one of you to be able to serve the Lord, serve in His kingdom. So the third way, my dear friends, we can expand the kingdom of God is by teaching the children. Now, when I say children, I also mean our spiritual children. But our own physical, biological children, the ones we interact with, day in and day out. Do you agree that we have to be more involved? You know, a lot of us, unfortunately, my dear friends, we leave it up to the next gen. Sunday, ah, bahala na yung Sunday school. Ah, bahala na yung teacher. Ah, bahala na yung principal. Ah, bahala na yung pastor. That's not how it should be. My friends, parents, we have to take on the responsibility of teaching our children. Look what is happening in the world today. You know, unfortunately, the Philippines, we pattern so many things after the, after the U.S., but what is happening in the U.S. today? Ever since they, take out, they took out prayer, wala nang prayer in schools. It's banned. Instead, they put in things like New Age, yoga, these things. They took out prayer. And look at the American, look at the society of the West today. And unfortunately, we are getting a lot of our own social fiber value system from the West. Because why? We think they're better than us. They're better than us, so we should learn from them. Well, my dear friends, that is the biggest lie. That is the biggest lie. Do they still respect their elders? Do they respect authority? The best thing we can do for our children, my dear friends, is to teach them this. What is this? To love God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. And secondly, what can we teach our children? To honor, to respect, and obey their parents and other authority. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 to 7, basahin po natin lahat. You shall what? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way 
and when you lie down and when you rise up. Let me show you this photo. Who said, oh? This was taken approximately maybe 18 years ago when we were still relatively new in the faith. But even then, I, the reason why I'm showing this, by the way, is this is a testament of the goodness of God in my family. You know, I was not a good father. 90% of the sins of my family were committed by yours truly. Maybe even more. Okay? But by the grace of God, He gave us the opportunity to make a decision at one point in our lives. You know what that decision was? To seek Him first above all else. And you know what? It's a miracle. Because God worked. You know, I was a very bad son. I gave my parents a lot of headaches and nightmares. But by God's grace, my children did not. Why? Because we were already walking in the path of righteousness. I'm not saying we're perfect, okay? We made a lot of mistakes. But we made a decision to make God the number one priority in our lives. We opened up our home. We had weekly D groups. We invested our time, our effort towards what? Building God's kingdom. Last week, we celebrated a very special event. This is the last photo of my all single children. Because a few moments after this, we had officially a new member of our family, our beloved daughter-in-law, Vida. Again, I do not want you to think that I am bragging. I am not. I am doing this as a testament of God's faithfulness and His goodness. That if you invest your lives in His kingdom for His glory, my dear friends, I guarantee you, you will never get disappointed. My family, it's my barcada. We enjoy our time together. We bond with one another. They are my ministry team. Each of them are involved. I thank God so much. I do not deserve this. But it is a testament to the faithfulness and the goodness of God that God will never disappoint you. If you truly put Him above all else, if you seek Him first, you will never be disappointed. So, my dear friends, what do we teach our children? In Proverbs 22.6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We need to teach our children deliberately about the Word of God. It's all there. The Bible is the manual, the life's manual that God has given to each and every one of us. And if we truly seek Him first, I guarantee you, you will never be disappointed. You know, a lot of us parents, nobody likes to discipline. Nobody likes to be disciplined. I remember when I was a kid, every time my father would spank me, I would rush to the room. I would put on five pairs of pants para hindi ko maramdaman yung, yung sakit ng palo. Discipline is hard. But it is it necessary. Is it necessary? You know, sinasabi natin, ah, papaluin mo, hindi tama yan. Hindi na uso yan. He, let me tell you, hindi na dadala sa uso yan. Discipline, just as God disciplines His children because He loves us. If we do not discipline our children, my dear friends, we are dishonoring God. All discipline, according to Hebrews 12, 11, for the moment, seems not to be joyful. Yes, of course. Who wants to discipline? Masakit. It's sorrowful, yes. Yet, listen to this. To those who have been trained by it afterwards, what does it do? It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Do we need to be disciplined? 
Do we, must we also discipline our children? Now, I'm not talking about beating them up. That's a totally different thing. That's child abuse. That's wrong. But that doesn't mean we don't spank them in a loving way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do not use your hand, by the way. Use a stick or something else. And when you discipline, let us not be emotional. Let us not be angry. Let us explain to them why we are doing what we are doing because we love them and we want them to learn and because that is what God wants us to do. Amen? Amen. But the greatest way to teach our children, my dear friends, listen to me, is by modeling it. It's by being a good example to them. We can tell them how to behave. We can tell them everything, the whole Bible from cover to cover. But if we do not live the life, I'm not saying we're perfect. I make mistakes. But can I share with you, when we do make mistakes, what do we do? Let us humble ourselves and apologize to them. Say, you know what? I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I got angry at you. I'm sorry about that. Need to humble ourselves. It's never too late, my friends. It's never too late. You can start today. So how do we expand the kingdom of God? First is our personal walk. Second is obedience by discipling and sharing the gospel. Third is by teaching the children. And finally, the fourth is by caring for the poor and the sick. How important is caring for the poor and the sick? Jesus himself, when he talked about the great judgment, what did he say? The king will answer and say to them, Truly, I say to you, to the extent, listen, that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, what did Jesus say? Who did you do it for? You did it for me. Is this important to Jesus? Helping the poor and the sick, is it? Absolutely. So how do we do this? How do we do this? In Colossians 3.12, let's read it together. It says, So as those who have been chosen of God. Are you chosen of God? Do you believe that you are chosen of God? Yes or no? If you are chosen of God, then what does He want from us? We must be holy and beloved. Put on a, put on a. See, we were not necessarily born. I was never a compassionate person. I was a mean guy. But the, the, the Word of God is telling you, telling us, put on a heart of what? Of compassion, of kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So perhaps we're thinking, wow, wait a minute. I'm only one person. I have limited time. I have limited funds. There are so many poor people out there, in fact. Half of the world's population lives on less than 90 pesos a day. How am I possibly going to make a difference? Have you ever thought that? Yes or no? Come on, just between us. I thought it. Right? Sabi ni Mother Teresa, if you cannot feed 100 people, then how many do you feed? Start with one. She also said, never worry about the numbers. Help one person at a time and always start with whom? With the one nearest to you. The book of Proverbs tells us that whoever is generous to the poor lends to whom? To whom? To the Lord and he will repay. You see, the Lord God is a rewarder. When we do something for the Lord, he will reward us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you think the Lord is just one way, kabig ng kabig, take and take and take and take? No. You can never outgive God. I'm telling you, my dear friends, you can never outgive God. Matthew 3, 5.42 says, Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You know, CCF Makati, we have a very special team. Where's Bong and Monsi and, and your group? I want you to stand up. Bong, are you here? Monsi, were you raptured already? <laughs> oh, they went ahead. It's okay. Maybe it's better they're not here. But I just wanted to thank God for this group because they have been spending 
Also, Tech. Where is Tech? Tech Cabrera, are you here? Tech? Tech is a very uh, humble lady. I don't think she will even stand up. But the purpose I am calling their names is because these people have invested so much of their time, their talent, their treasure in going to all areas around helping people. Helping people. So how do you actually help people? Is it just a matter of giving them food to eat all the time, feeding all the time, food na lang ng food? No improvement in their lives? Well, let me tell you this. Benjamin Franklin said this. I am for doing good to the poor, but I differ in opinion about the means. I think the best way of doing good for the poor is not making them ease in poverty, easy in poverty, but leading or driving them out of it. You know, my friends, unfortunately, many, many of our brethren who are disadvantaged never learned any better. They never went to school. They were never taught by their parents. But what I'm telling you, it's not too late. You can be a part of this. Here in CCF, we have the uplift movement. We can be, we can make a contribution, whether it's money, time, or whatever it is. You can contribute towards their education, towards their livelihood, towards their health, and towards the spiritual, most importantly. Many of them have been helped by this foundation, which we are a part of, Tanglao ng Buhay. This is a microfinance. So what am I saying? The best way for us to help the poor is not only for their temporary, but their long-term needs as well. The most importantly is the spiritual needs, and then next is the temporal needs. What about the sick? Many of you have been joining the bronze staff and the pastoral care. When people are in the hospital, what do they need? They need what? Prayers. They need for us to go to them, to visit them, to show concern, to show our love, to show what? Compassion. Okay? We can be part of all of this. We can do all of this to expand the vision of God. You know, Jesus cared a lot for the sick. He cared a lot for the sick. In Mark chapter 1, 40, 41, he said, A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus, filled with compassion, reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Jesus, filled with compassion. Everybody was detesting. You know how a leper is? How difficult it is? It's your skin slowly, your, your muscles, everything just wasting away, just exposing your innards. It's a horrible disease. But God, Jesus, was filled with compassion. The same compassion that He wants each and every one of us to have. So, as we close, let us remind ourselves of how we expand the vision of God through our lives. How we make the light shine through us. So that for what purpose? For God's glory. You know, there is a family. Not only a family, but a whole big D group who have taken up the call of the Lord and decided we will go out of our comfort zones we don't know where we're going, but Lord, we trust in you to lead us. To lead us to a part of the city that has not seen the light. That needs the light. Today, I would like to ask Dennis and Lisa Salud to give their testimony about their new, their new calling to be the team in CCF Manila. Praise God. Hi, good morning. My name is Dennis Salud, and this is my wife, Lisa, and, and Ruth, my 
youngest. We've been with CCF since before we got married 13 years ago. We have four children, Sophie, DJ, Josh, and Ruth. Three years ago, Pastor Albert spoke to me during one of our family lunch gatherings and told me, Bro, I'd like to challenge you to handle the next-gen ministry of CCF Makati. I want you to pray about it. Hearing this, I was shocked and puzzled more than anything. I couldn't understand why he would ask me, of all people, to handle this ministry. I knew nothing about Next Gen, and the only reason I could ever think of as to why he picked me was that our kids were little and they went to Next Gen. But I prayed about it, and I told Lisa to pray with me as well. It's amazing because this challenge came at a time when I was looking into doing something that would really impact, in fact, in, impact my life eternally. Maybe this is it, so I thought to myself. After much prayer and with the full support of Lisa, I texted Pastor Albert about a week after that and told him I would accept the challenge. This decision was purely by faith because of my inexperience. And when I accepted this challenge, it was at the height of my busyness at work. My insecurity also set in because, in all honesty, I didn't know if I had what it took to be a next-gen ministry head. It's been more than three years now, and as I look back, I realize that my next-gen experience is something I wouldn't ever exchange for anything. The privilege of sharing the love of Jesus to the kids, seeing smiles on their faces, hearing them say, I love you, listening to them pour out their problems, and working with a great next-gen team that loves the Lord and serves Him with passion, these things I will always cherish in my heart. Early this year, a new challenge came my way, again from Pastor Albit. This time, it involved planting a CCF church in Manila area. Again, I was asked to pray about it. I knew in my heart that it was, if this was truly God's will and plan for my life, things would push through whether or not I cooperated with Him. So I accepted the challenge. But along with this decision, I found myself being confronted with so many trials. From problems at work to worsening financial problems. I couldn't understand why God would allow me to suffer this way in spite of the fact that I committed to fully cooperate with His plans for my life. I wasn't sure if my growing problems were a result of God directing me away from this decision. Or if it was the devil just trying to derail and discourage me. I'll be honest, I wrestled with God many times on this. Not too long ago, my family came upon a decision to move to Liliu Laguna, my mom's hometown. We received numerous confirmations from the Lord that this was the direction He, he would have us take. With regard to overseeing CCF Manila, I thought, surely I'm off the hook now. But deep in my heart, I also knew that I would never be fully satisfied unless I was in the center of God's will. I asked a wise brother in Christ what his process was to confirming or validating God's will. He gave me three pronged approach. First, through the counsel of God's authorities over me. Second, through a holy restlessness. And third, through biblical confirmation. 
with regard to the first point, in spite of my moving to Laguna and the logistical headache that goes with it, my disciple and uh, our dear pastor, Pastor Albert, was unflinching every time I would ask him, Bro, are you sure I'm the man, I, I'm the man for the job? He always answered in the affirmative. As the second point, the holy restlessness. I've experienced the restlessness. Um, I would wake up in the middle of the night and it kept me from going back to sleep many times over. And oftentimes, I would decide to do my prayer time and Bible reading since I was already up. It was during one of these early morning appointments with the Lord There's a speck in my eye. <laughs> the Lord, I, I prayed and cried out to God. And I, I asked him point blank, Lord, is this really what you want me to do? Do you, re do you really want me to be part of the planting of CCF Manila? All of a sudden, I have colds. <laughs> and he gave me his biblical confirmation. And during this time, I, I was reading the book of John, and I was in John chapter 21. Here's the context of this passage. After Jesus was crucified... He appeared before his disciples in the Sea of Galilee. The disciples had been fishing all night and caught nothing. Before they could recognize who he was, Jesus instructed them to cast their nets on the right side of the boat where they caught so much fish that they could not haul their nets in. The disciples then realized that it was Jesus they were talking to and they proceeded to share a meal together. I'll now read to you verses 15 and se to 17. So, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. With this biblical confirmation, there was no turning back from me. As a family, we continue to struggle with many problems, self-inflicted self and otherwise. But God is faithful. He has not made us endure more than we can bear. We believe that our trials have been allowed to grow to near insurmountable proportions because sometimes the Lord has to empty us of ourselves so that His strength may be made perfect in our weakness. As a family, we often pray together and we, cho we choose to thank God for all He has done and all He will do for us. We, co we covet your prayers for wisdom and protection as we embark in this new chapter in our lives. This new mission, if you will, kindly pray for our family and the rest of the CCF Manila Council of Slaves as we heed God's call for us to leave our respective comfort zones and take part in this exciting new adventure. May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in Manila for He alone is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. Thank you. Praise God. Can I ask now?
the CCF Manila team to please stand. Let us all pray. Can I ask everyone to stand and raise your right hand? Okay, the CCF Manila team. Can you step forward, please? Heavenly Father, we commit CCF Manila into your hands. We thank you for what you are doing in the hearts of our brethren here who have now decided to take on the challenge to be part of the new CCF Manila team. Lord, would you prepare the way for them? Would you go ahead of them? Lord, would you assure that this seed now that is to be planted will grow and that the light will be present in that place to, to overcome, Lord God, the darkness. We pray, Lord, that your mighty hand would be upon them, that you would bless them, provide for them, O oh God, protect them. Father, we pray that this church, this new church, would become deep and wide, all in accordance with your will and all for your greater glory, O oh God. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, guys. Do you know that um, Dennis, Lisa, and their children will be traveling 200 kilometers every Sunday morning from Liliu Laguna up to Taft Avenue, Manila, just to serve the Lord. Praise God. So let us pray for this family and for all the families, the De Leons, for um, the other families as well that have heeded the call of God. Shall we? Shall we do that? Okay, so as we close, let us remind ourselves of what must we do to expand God's vision on this earth. Let your light shine, Jesus is saying, before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So as we close, we expand the vision through personal growth and maturity, through obeying the call to evangelize and to disciple, to teach the children to care for the poor and the sick. And if we do so, God has a promise for us in Hebrews 11.6. It says that without faith... So what do we need, my friends? What do we need to be able to do this? We need to have what? Faith. We need to trust in God. That God is who He is. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. As followers of Christ, let us take the way of the cross. Celebrate God's presence through our lives, reaching out to others. Let us obey His will. Let us study His word. And let us strengthen one another as we close in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank You for this message today. Lord, we pray that we would not merely be merely hearers of the word, but doers, Father. We pray that each and every one of us now would accept Your challenge to us, Lord God to heed your calling. We know that each of us has a special purpose, a special mission to serve you, Almighty God. Father, if there is anyone here today who is not sure of whether he is with you, whether he has accepted the gift of everlasting life by faith, I would like to request that individual, whoever he is, if you are ready to surrender everything to the Lord Jesus Christ, to make Him the King of your life, to accept the gift of everlasting life, then I ask you to pray this prayer called the sinner's prayer. Lord, I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that I cannot pay for my own sins. I know, Lord God, that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ. By faith, I believe that He died on the cross to pay for my sins. Lord Jesus, first of all, I want to ask you to forgive me for all the sins that I have committed. I ask you now, Lord Jesus, to enter my heart 
come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I thank you for the most precious gift, the gift of eternal life. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you all.